So today we're going to talk about the world of fonts and typography and uh, kind of the, the importance of that. Some of you may have already experienced this in like 121, for example, when you do your first pro poster and Daniel kicks half of them back and says you picked the wrong font. Um, that's, that's normal. But we're going to try to correct that and we're going to talk about fonts. We're going to talk about typography. We'll talk a lot about the uh, actual terminology, what is an X height, what is an ascender, what is a descender, and all that sort of thing, which will help you kind of figure out this world of fonts. Before I get too started, though, I like to, uh, to reference something and or give you a tiny piece of homework, though none of you will probably do it, but it's, it's worth it, and it is worth your time to do it, and that is, has anybody seen the Steve Jobs commencement speech that he gave at Stanford? No? Okay, if you have not seen it, waste 15 minutes of your life and watch it. Okay, it's totally old. This is before he did anything, you know, too dramatic. Uh, no iPhones yet, none of that kind of stuff. But uh, the video is kind of grainy, and you know, you can you can see that. But his message is very clear, and he talks about where a lot of his inspiration came from in his life, and why he ended up doing what he did, and why he was so obsessed with the little details. Right? The details that are, no, this phone isn't good enough, throw it back, and, and no, I don't want any buttons on my phone, and, and those kinds of things. And that, a lot of it came from a class that he took in college, even though he didn't graduate with a degree in college. Uh, it was a class on typography and why fonts matter and the little things in life. Right? And this is huge for designers, and it's a huge big deal, and it's part of why in a modern operating system we have so many font choices. So just because he took that one class in college, we, as a society, got a huge benefit. And so I like to kind of introduce this topic because of that kind of story and why it's important. So do spend the time. I hope that you do. Right? There's no way of me checking. I'm not going to give you a test on it. But really, seriously, do it because it's really worth your time. Okay. So let's move on into the world of typefaces. I'm going to start with the definition of terms so that we have some common ground to actually be able to talk about uh, what fonts are and, and what make them up. And some of this stuff will be, oh, I know that. right? But maybe you don't know all of the details of it. So let's start first in the world of style. right? We have generally the regular style, which is what we most often use. We have an italicized style. Right, which means the letters are slanted over. And then we have a bold style. Usually they're used to provide some kind of contrast or emphasis. Right? You're typing out your English paper. Right? You need to cite a word or something. You make it in italics. You have a really long quote. You italicize it. Whatever. Right? It's to draw emphasis to something. Right? But this last point is really important, and that is that some fonts have a designed version of bold or a designed version of italics. Other fonts, right, or sometimes your operating system overrides the, the, the pre-designed version and just slants the images or the, the, the letters to make them italicized. And it's not nearly as good. Let me show you an example. Okay? So on the bottom here, under where I have OS, right, this is what the operating system does. Right? And let me just draw on this for just a second. Okay, So we have the regular. right? We have the italicized version, which basically is slanted. Right? We have the bold version, which thickens up the letters a bit. Right? And we have a bold italic version at the end. Okay? Down here, we also have a slanted version that represents an italicized version. Okay? This looks reasonable, wouldn't you say? It's OK. Okay? But let's look at what happens if the font designer actually makes a version of these fonts. Okay? So if we look up here at the top, right? obviously the first two are identical. Nothing fancy going on there. But look at the difference in the italicized version. Right? Look at the Z, for example. Right? It's a much better style than just slanting the letters over. It's more readable. It looks better. Right? Because the designer of the typeface actually spent the time to think about what does an italicized Z look like. It's not just a slanted version of a regular Z. Right? Similarly, bold 
right? Bold doesn't just thicken, right? Look at the A's, for example, here, right? The, the lower one, down here at the bottom, they just thicken up the whole letter all the way around, even thickening, okay? If we look at the A at the top, the, the very top of the A, right there, right, is still thin, but they've thickened up the sides of the A, okay? So it's a different way of looking at what is bold. It's still very bold, Right? But they've thought about what the letter form actually looks like. Similarly, the bold italics. Okay? Let's move forward into the full italicized version. Right? This looks a whole lot different. This italicized version right there looks a lot different than just slanting the letters over. Right? A lot more care goes into the letters. It's a lot more readable. Right? And it really provides a lot of emphasis that just slanting the letters don't do. Okay? So in this particular case, it's a perfect example of how we've gone from the operating system change to the designed font change. Right? And often this is listed under, let's say you're looking for Helvetica New, right? and you're looking at that font, and then there'll be a bunch of sub-fonts that say you know, Helvetica New you know, Light, italicized, or whatever. Uh, those are all designed by the, the font typeface designer in the first place. We move into weight, which is the relative lightness or darkness of the letter forms marked by the line width. So of the letter, how thick is that line? Okay? So we might have a light version of a font, which is a very thin version. We might have a regular or a medium version of the font, which is kind of in the middle. And then we might have a bold version, which is very thick. Okay? So let's look at the, uh, the, li the list here. Right? The font weight up here at the top is thin, and we move down to extra light, light, regular, medium, semi-bold, bold, black, and super. Right? So this also could be within a font family in a designed set of typeface. So we can go all the way from thin right, all the way up to super. Right? And different people have different opinions about where certain things are appropriate. Anybody update to the latest iPhone, the iOS 10 yet? Did you notice the clock got thicker? Right? A lot of people complained because the original clock was too thin to read. Right? For me personally, it drives me nuts that they made the clock thinner. I thought the thin or thicker because I thought the thinner clock was nicer. Right? But it's a design preference. The point is that you want to think about what is an appropriate weight for what you're trying to do and make sure that that comes across. And we'll talk about that in, in paragraph form a little bit later. Width also can be different variations in a typeface. You might have a condensed or a compressed, which gets the, the words get closer together, the letter forms get closer together. Or you might have something that's extended. Anybody use extended before when they wanted their paper to get a little bit longer in English class, maybe? Right? It's kind of like when you went to 13 point or 13.2 point font, right? Yeah, I won't make you raise your hands, but a few of you are nodding, right? You know who you are. Right? There's better ways. I'm going to teach you those today. Okay? X height. Okay? X height tells us a lot about a font and what it looks like. It lets us compare fonts to other fonts. And what X height essentially is, is exactly what it's saying. The height of an X. Right? X is a great letter to compare because generally it's square and generally it has a consistent height. Okay? Um, if we look at Cap height, on the other hand, this would be the height of a capital letter, okay, which is different than an X. So let's look at it in this form. This is this is oftentimes a little bit easier, okay. So we look over here at the that the the last letter here as an X. This from here to here is your X height, okay. Your cap height is up up over here, right? That's the height of your capital letter. Sometimes the cap height is the same as the ascender height. In this case, the ascender height is just a little bit taller than the cap height. right? And we also have a descender down here. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Counters are the white spaces that are located inside and around letter forms. Okay? If we look at letters not as letters but as shapes, right? it's the void inside the O, for example. That's a counter. They affect the overall legibility, readability, or density of what it is that you're presenting. Thin fonts at large type sizes 
can have very open counters that make them difficult to read, right? The opposite is true for bold fonts. If you have a font that's small and bold, the counters are really small and it makes it difficult to read. So let's look at an example, okay? So errors up top, there's a lot of open space, a lot of big counters can make that a little bit harder to read. Likewise, if we look at the bold font that's small, right, the counters are small, it's a little bit harder to read, right? It's easier when this is in printed form in front of you, right, than on the screen because even though this is really, really small on the screen, it's still relatively big, you can still see it, right? Such is life. Small capitals are a complete set of uppercase letters that are the same height as an X height. Okay, and you've probably seen these before. The reason that these are important is that they can be used when you don't want to put too much emphasis on something. Okay, when we're writing, we use abbreviations sometimes. Um, when we use those abbreviations, if we use all capitals, it can draw unwanted attention to every time we use, uh, you know, WHO, World Health Organization, right? The WHO is too big, right? If we're just in the flow of text, we might use this cap height, this small capital, so that the, the cap height is down to the X height and it goes with the flow of your text. Okay, so you wanna think about that. Lining and non-lining figures, figures refers to numbers, okay? And this has to do with what are the shapes of the numbers and are they um, the full cap height or not. So we have over here on the left side, we have lining numerals, which means that the baseline of the numbers is even, and they go all the way up to the cap height. Okay, non-lining, so over here, right, the baseline is right there, but the numbers have ascenders and descenders. Right? The bulk of the number, the number two, for example, is going to fall between right, the baseline and the x height. Okay? The four, the five, and the six up here is going to have a descender or an ascender. Okay? So why is this important? Again, if we're writing a long paragraph of text, right, and we can see the long paragraphs down here at the bottom, Right? The, the numbers tend to stand out because they're really tall. Okay? If on the other hand, we look over here, right, same paragraph, see how the numbers flow with the text? They don't stand out, they jump, don't jump out at you. Does that make sense? So it's designed for big paragraphs flowing in the body of the text where you don't want the numbers to have overemphasis. Right? The lining numerals are are more common, certainly, but they're also very much, here's the number, right? And the text doesn't flow as well around them. So it's something to be aware of. Ligatures are specially designed characters when you smush letters together, okay? And when you combine these letters together, right, it would replace those groupings of letters. And I guess the easiest way of explaining this is, Let's say you were, you were writing by hand, right? And you wrote two T's. Like my son's name is Bennett, right? So I go B-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, and I cross the two T's that way, right? That essentially is a ligature because I've combined them. I don't come to the end and do two T's, T, T, right? I don't do that, okay? So you're doing the same thing naturally in your handwriting a font should do the same thing. So let's look at some examples, okay? So when we combine things like, and on the left side here, right, we've got FI, FFI, FFL, and on the right side we have the ligature combination. So you notice that the top of the lowercase f becomes the dot in the i, right? Likewise, the f's become different heights when the two f's are together to distinguish the two f's. Right? FFL, the L ends up being connected. We lose the serif on the L. Right? So there are little details. Here, right there. The, the serif becomes part of the F. Right? So those little details make the text much easier to read and much easier to flow. Good fonts will think about some of the other uh, discretionary ligatures. 
So some fonts will do this, some fonts won't, and it has to do with how you combine other letters together. So the S and the T, sometimes you can combine those together. I think the G and the I is nicely done. The S and the T I don't think are quite as important to combine them together. Uh, but you can kind of see how these work together. The Q and the U with the Q tail right here going under the U is nice, right? So they're little details, but they can make a big difference. The good news for you is that your, your, your modern operating system, right, we're working in InDesign, it should, assuming the font is a good font, naturally do this. When you put those letters together, you put the two T's together, the two T's, the cross, should go across both of them, right? Those things should automatically happen which is good. Choosing the right font. So some of you nodded your heads when I talked about Daniel kicking your first poster back saying you picked the wrong fonts, right? This is very common, and that is that we have to think about what font we're choosing and why. And is it appropriate or is it not appropriate for our particular design? So we want to think about what is the longevity of the piece, right? We're doing a poster, is it short-lived? Is it going to be something that's going to be around for a long time? Is it a book or something like that? And therefore, is the font appropriate or not? What is the purpose of the piece? You might use a font for a specific purpose. Maybe a different one is, is more important. So for example, we talk about the poster. You do a poster on uh, Mies van der Rohe, for example, modernist architecture. It would make sense to do a serif or a sans serif font. I haven't told you about serifs yet. right? It would make sense to do a sans serif font because it's a modernist font. Right? So you want to pay attention to what is the purpose and therefore make the font match. Okay? Is it innovative or outdated? I'll tell you a story about that in just a second. Is it traditional? Is it too conservative? Right? Times New Roman, right? default font, it's horrible. Right? But it's used a lot. It's used in newspapers. It's easy to read. Right? There are other alternatives as a graphic designer that might be a little bit better, right? or might feel a little bit better. You want to pay attention to those. OK, so I told you I'd, I'd use an example. Okay, anybody seen the movie Avatar? Right, maybe. Okay, So there was a lot of controversy over this because the title of the movie and also the uh, subtitles in the movie right, use this font called Papyrus. Okay. Papyrus was, was done, I forget by who, uh, who did it, but it was created in 1982. It has, for some reason, existed on our computers and become very fashionable, or was very fashionable in the mid-2000s-ish. Right? And it got so fashionable that you were seeing it absolutely everywhere. Right? You were seeing it on restaurant windows. You were seeing it you know, made into little like, wall art things. Right? It became this big fad. Okay? Now we start to look at it and we say, yeah, it's not looking so good. Right? I don't think it's aged particularly well. It'll be interesting to see if the next avatar has the same font in it or whether they evolve it or not. Right? These are the kinds of things you have to be aware of. Right? Because fonts become very in fashion and they drop out of fashion. And you want to think about, is your font choice an appropriate one or is it going to become out of fashion? Right? So you want to be aware of those kinds of things. You want to compare typefaces side by side for readability. Are they evoking the right emotion? Right? Do they look right? right? How many people, when you did that first poster, did you compare multiple fonts? Probably not. A few of you did. Right? It's easy to just, oh, I'm just going to pick the first font. I'm going to pick Arial, and we'll go with it. Right? Well, the truth is that there's a lot of variety in the, in, in the fonts. On these computers, there's probably 100 fonts. Right? On a Mac, there's probably more. There's probably closer to 200 by default. Right? They're all in there for you to use. And it's important to find the right one. Okay? Does it reflect the needs of the client and the viewer? We talked a lot about that last cli class. The client's the person paying for it or asking you to do the work. The viewer's the person who's ultimately looking at it. Does it reflect those two people? Is it doing its job? Okay? So two examples here, right? two different fonts. They both are uh, serif fonts, so they're both relatively easy to read when we look at them. Right? But they're very different. They feel different. Right? The one on the left feels maybe a little more casual. The one on the right maybe feels a little bit more formal. Right? You want to think about which one is appropriate for what you're trying to, to convey. So this is fun. 
It's a great infographic, right? A play on the periodic table of elements. And they work their way all the way from the most basic fonts up at the top in Helvetica and Futura, uh, all the way down into the kind of crazy old English whatever, the same way the periodic table works its way down. It's kind of fun. I don't know that it's really valuable to you, but if you Google it, you can, you can pull up a really large scale version of it, and it's kind of fun to see it. Okay? The next graphic I actually like more, and that is the so you need a typeface graphic. And I think this is really, this is really quite fun uh, when you follow your way through. Right? So we start here in the middle with the so you need a typeface. Right? And then we move. And you know, I tried my best to show this on the projector uh, such that you can actually see it. You probably need to look at it um, you know, on your computer screen, but we'll work our way through it. OK, so we come down here. We need a typeface. OK, I want it to be a logo. All right. Well, if it's a logo, do I want it to be uh, a sans serif, or do I want it to be a serif? And so depending on which direction I go, it flows through. I want it to be a sans serif. Do you like geometrics? Yes or no? Right? So I'll say, yes, I do. OK. Then I move down over here. So do you like Futura? No, I don't like Futura. Oh, well, then you should pick Metro. Right? So it's kind of fun. Is it end all? No. But it might be a good place to start. If you're struggling with what font to pick, right, this can be a good way of working it through. Right? Um, if we go backwards, this font right here, Optima, is what I use to write the book. It's what I use to write my thesis. Right? And if you go, your backward, you go backwards to that, um, I have to work my way back. Yep. Good news. And I did this without having this chart, right? I want to write a book. Okay? Are you completely in doubt? Yes or no? Right? No, I'm not in doubt. I come down here. Uh, a champion of usability? Uh, no. Right? Everybody loves Garamond? No. Right? Sorry, I'm trying to do this in two places at once, right? Do you want a sans serif? Is that the case? Right? So we move over here. Yes, I want a sans serif, and there I am at Optima. Right, so it's kind of fun. Whatever. So how about the infograph one? Yeah. So let's, I've talked a lot about sans serif and serif. And I probably should have put this a little bit earlier in the, in the slide so that you could see this earlier. But there are two fundamental types of fonts. One is a serif font, and one is a sans serif. So without the serif. Okay? The difference here is the little tails that occur on the font itself. And so you see the, the highlight right here, right? There's a foot to the font. At the ends of the F, or excuse me, at the ends of the S, there's a little bit of a tail, right? Those little tails on all the letters really enhance readability. They make it much easier to read. If you think about all the magazines that you've read, not that you read paper magazines anymore, right? But if you think about magazines that you've read, if you think about books that you've read, right, they all use a serif font because it's easier for our eyes to distinguish the individual letters and therefore to read. Right? The sans serif, on the other hand, is very clean. It became very fashionable to use it for blogs and online writing, though I think it makes it a little bit more difficult to read the online writing. Right? Generally speaking, the online writing, the fonts are a little bit bigger which compensate for the fact that we don't have the serif. Right? If you think about the Harry Potter book, right? you guys read Harry Potter? Yes. I'm not that old, right? Okay. You think about the Harry Potter books, right? towards the end they were like this. Okay. If you switched from a serif font used in those books to a sans serif font and you had to make the font bigger, suddenly the book would be like this thick. Right? So you want to think about right? the serif can make the font smaller and still make it easier to read. So you want to be aware of those kinds of things. The sans serif is great for a kind of a modernist look. You're doing a poster, you want it to feel modern, that's a good place to start. Right? Uh, and so there are certainly advantages to both. Sometimes you want to combine typefaces together. Well, first off, before you jump ship and say, I want multiple typefaces to come together, maybe you should think about just using a single family but varying the widths and the styles within the family. Right? Thin to thick, bold, not bold, right? italicized, not italicized. You can get a lot of contrast and emphasis using just one font family. If, however, you really feel like you have to combine font families together, you want to think about making them compatible with each other. 
So number one, you shouldn't combine two serif fonts together or two sans serif fonts together because they will naturally compete with each other. Right? They're too similar. So you want one with the little tails and one without the tails. So with the serifs and without. You also want the two to have the same x height. Because if they don't have the same x height, they won't feel like they belong together. Okay, So that's critical. These are a variety. The Big Caslon and Myriad Pro are examples. Sabon Syntax, uh, Meriden, etc. Here's another set. Right? Notice that on these, even though the fonts are different, right, the x heights are the same right, in the combinations. Right? And they can end up being nice as combinations as well. Right? You also have, and I haven't really talked a lot about this, you have these script fonts, the ones that you think you're inviting somebody to a wedding, right? those script fonts. You have the headline fonts, the display fonts. Right? Those obviously can, combine, can be combined with other fonts, right? but they're really for headlines. If you turned in your English paper or your history paper and it was written out in a cursive script font, Right? Your English teacher would think you had lost your head, and they'd probably fail you for that, right? or they'd fail that project. Okay? So you want to think about what's appropriate. Maybe the title might be appropriate in script, but nothing else. It's too hard to read. Right? Anybody get, you know, received a wedding invitation in the mail, and you're like, really? That's my name? Right? Especially the, the, like the handwritten super calligraphy ones. It's like, whoa, I don't know what that says. Right? The point is, you want to pay attention to where it's appropriate and where it's not appropriate. Nope. Right. Designing with type. We want to think a lot about legibility and readability. Okay? It's ex as absolutely essential for successful communication to have both legibility and readability of a particular font. So legibility is the recognition of individual letter forms right, relative to positions of other letters. Right? Readability is how the whole typography is presented to the viewers as words, lines, paragraphs, etc. Okay? So let's, let's try an experiment. No, oh, not quite. Okay? We'll go through this first. Legibility, the top one. Right? Arial seems easy enough to understand. Right? Mesquite. This is the font that's on like the charcoal briquettes or something like that, right? The backyard barbecue. It's pretty hard to read, right? Right? So is that appropriate? Is it legible? Are the individual letter forms legible? Not really. Okay? Readability. Right? Notice in readability, we have a serif font, much easier to read. The sans serif, you can read it. It's a little harder. Right? There's a lot of open counters in that too. Uh, content, right? Impact is great for a headline. If you have a big old paragraph with it, it's too hard to read, too dense, right? The counters are too small. Context, Times New Roman, this is a financial high power document, right? If you use Comic Sans, probably wouldn't get the same thing across. But do you see how critical what font you pick is, right? Comic Sans is perfect for like fourth grade. Right? Teachers love Comic Sans. Okay? And that's nothing against it, but it's appropriate for certain things and it's not for other things. And you want to make sure that you're following through with this. Objective representation. Right? Practical, straightforward, versus, or, and clear, ordered presentation of information. Right? Clear, to the point, nothing fancy. Subjective representation. Right? is where you vary the fonts and you kind of work through it. It's heavily focused on theme or an experience. Right? Generally, if you're thinking about like a portfolio, this is probably the direction to go. Right? We as creative types love to do more interesting things. But you want to think about that purpose. Think about macro perspectives. Right? What is the overall design layout? Right? How does this fit into the composition as a whole? What is there in terms of a typographic hierarchy? Right? Big, bold, heading, subheading, subtext, right? footnote text. How do those elements work together 
as a font family maybe, as a size family, right? What's the consistency there? I will think before I make decisions. Micro perspective are the small details, like the kerning, the spacing, the ragging. We'll talk about what all of these are in a little bit. They ensure the clean presentation. They're the little details. So we want to think about big picture, small picture, right? Font choice, big picture, right? What the spacing between the letters are, small picture. But we focus on all of it. I just like this. I can't read it, but it's really nicely done. Right? The fonts are well chosen. Symmetry versus asymmetry. Symmetry is generally a balance or a harmony, great for like an English paper. Right? Consistent. Asymmetrical, activity, motion, draw attention to one side versus the other. Right? Focus your attention can work great in a portfolio setting, but it's something to think about. Alignment is the horizontal and vertical position of the typography within the margin, right? It creates the visual relationships between the elements of design. This one I won't spend too much time on because next lecture we'll spend almost the entire time talking about this sort of thing. Okay, so we'll get there. Typographic color refers to the density of the typographic elements, right? and their relative perceived gray value. So what is the overall lightness or darkness of the page, right, et cetera. So essentially, if we were looking at this, this, this piece here, and you squint at it a little bit, right, does one of the paragraphs leap out at you? Right, which one's darker? Right, it's this one right here. That one's darker, right? Some of the paragraphs are lighter when you kind of squint at it. Maybe this one is lighter. Right? As you squint at it, maybe this one is lighter. So it's not necessarily because of the size of the text, it's just the overall perception of that relative darkness or lightness. Notice that every single one of these is actually a shape, and that graphically works as a shape and responds as a shape as part of your design. So when we move on to next class and we talk about layouts and margins and columns and all that sort of thing, a body of text works the same as an image. It's an active element in your page. You have to design with it and around it. Type size is measured in points, right? Changes in type size result in a hierarchy of elements. So if you do nothing else, if you have a 16 point, you know, a 12 point and a 10 point, that gives you a hierarchy. Headline, subheadline, uh, headline, body, footnote. You want to develop some kind of a proportionate scale of sizes so that it feels like these belong together. And then you obviously want to be consistent about using the same thing. Right? If you set up your headline as a 16 point font, and that headline varies between 18 point and 14 point, you're defeating the purpose. You have to be consistent throughout the document. They're all 16 point. And we'll talk about how do you do that um, in the world of InDesign. Case also matters. Okay? So in case, Lowercase letters are far more readable than uppercase letters, right? Uppercase emphasizes letter to letter recognition, which slows down the reading process. Okay? So let's think about it in an architectural sense. Okay? Do architects write in lowercase letters or do they write in all capitals? They write in all caps. Why do you think they do that? Right? It enhances the focus on what they're saying. Right? So we don't write long-winded things. We write short notes and small bodies of text, but we want people to concentrate on what we write. Right? If you're uh, you know, a history major, for example, not an architecture major, you would write a lot in this you know, standard case, lowercase letters. Okay? That's because you write pages and pages and pages of stuff. Right? Distinct contrast. So I like to draw attention to that. So let's, let's, play, let's play a game. Okay? Try to read this. For example, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word appear. The only important thing, right? You can do it, but you have to concentrate as you do this. Okay? What happens if we switch it? For example, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word appear. The only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. This is a lot easier to read, isn't it? Okay? The reason that this is easier to read is because we look at words 
and we look at the first letter, and we look at the last letter, and we understand the general shape of a word, and we recognize that word as we read. Okay? When we look at the all capital letters, there is no shape to the word. Does that make sense? They're all big rectangles. So you have to look at the individual letters, L-T-T-E-E-R-S, and think about, wait, wait, what is that word? And your brain translates it, right? However, when we look over here, right, letters, right, the tall first, about the right line length, right, we understand that form, it's much easier for your brain to come through and say, ah, that's letters, right? It also gets a lot easier the further down you go because your brain starts to substitute easier. Okay? But it's a fun game to play, and it tells you a lot about fonts and how they work. Kerning adjusts the space between individual letters, right? It's used to correct collisions and unwanted spaces. It allows the text to flow and read smoothly, okay? Generally speaking, you're only going to deal with kerning on titles, headlines, subheadings, something like that. You're not going to go through and adjust individual spacing in, a, in the middle of a paragraph, right? But if we look over here on the right, right, the default spacing, for example, of the word type, right, the Y and the T line up right there, okay? Really, if we were writing type, we would automatically stick the Y underneath the T, right? That happens right here, right, where the Y gets moved over to be under the T. That's corrected spacing, right? Default spacing down here, all capital letters, T-Y-P-E, right? The spacing is not even between the T and the Y, right? It's small, gets a little bit bigger, gets a little bit bigger, right? When it really should be consistent there and there, okay? So the bottom one is corrected, top one's not. Tracking is a lot like kerning except it's dealing with words, lines, and paragraphs. So it's the big picture the big perspective, okay? Tracking adjusts the spacing between words, lines, and paragraphs. Remember I told you not to increase the font size or not to use the extended font when you needed your English paper and I told you I'd teach you how to do that without? Right here, right? It's consistent, it's proportional, right? But it spreads out the words, right? So you can make that paper seem a little bit longer, right? Or you guys are all such good students. I'm sure it's the opposite, right? You need to compress it a little bit because you wrote too much, right? This works the opposite way too. We can compress it, okay? It also influences the typographic color. Remember that picture where we had the darker text versus the lighter text as we were looking at the overall paragraph? This can do that. You make it more dense, it gets darker in color. You extend it out, it becomes lighter in color, okay? You also don't track in between lowercase letters. Right? This is just overall paragraph style. Leading right, is the space between lines of text. Okay? This is like when you're in Word and you say, oh, I want it to be double space or 1.5 space or whatever. Right? In the world of InDesign, it's something called leading. Right? It's measured from one baseline to the next. If you have a tall X height or a heavy typeface right, or a sans serif, typeface, you need more space between the words, or between the lines, so that you can read it easier. Okay, remember I talked about the Harry Potter book, right, and I said that it would go from being this thick to being that thick, right? That's because of this sort of thing. If you want to read it, you need more space, because you're in a sans serif font, right? That's obviously why we choose a serif font, okay? So you want to be aware of those kinds of things, okay? So I'll end with just, I, I like to show portfolio examples if I can uh, as we go through it. I will give a lecture entirely on portfolio, so we'll talk about that at more depth. But this is specifically about the font and the type, right? Remember we talked about creating a nice hierarchy? This is the same font, right? Nothing special about it. But notice we've got the big, bold design portfolio, right? That's the headline item. Then we have architecture and the, the person's name, right? They're in the same size, but notice one's all capitals and one's mixed case, right? That provides a different emphasis, a different point uh, for each of those pieces, right? If we look at text inside, right? Very similar in setup, so the, the, the typography is consistent page to page, 
Big headline, thick, right? Capitals up top, I think that's the location of it, right? And then we have the body text, right? If we look down here even further, right, we have the, the, the subheading, but notice this and this are both lighter, right? So they're creating and establishing a nice hierarchy for this. Right? This is just nice images. Right? And then we have these little pullouts that are part of this particular portfolio. Not that I really recommend doing this for portfolios, but a much bigger, bolder font right, in that pullout. But here it is again. The capital letters first, followed by the, the big, bold title, and then the paragraph describing. Right? So it's consistent. Another example here, they, these images are a little bit blurry, but it's again a good, uh, good use of typography. Uh, you can barely see it. Um, it's a good combination. This is all capitals, letter to letter recognition. Yeah, you, can't, you can't see these well enough, so we'll just flip through them. Okay, so we'll take a quick break while I switch over to the other uh, computer, and then we're going to talk through working with text in InDesign and fonts, uh, and we'll go from there. Hold on one second. OK, so we're going to start back up. Let me close this door real quick. And I want to walk you through the world of typography in InDesign, because there's a lot that InDesign does very, very well about typography. Uh, and I think it's kind of one of the critical pieces of InDesign, and, and you're going to be using it a fair amount. Uh, while you work in InDesign as well. So I'm going to go ahead and create just a brand new document. Uh, and it can be a, just a standard letter page in the standard format. I'll go ahead and say OK. And it gives me my most basic standard page. Um, the pink lines that go around the page here are my margins, though they mean absolutely nothing. Um, your printer margins are different than these lines. They're completely arbitrary. So. I can move them or change them as I see fit. I like to try to point that out because a lot of people work within those margins and it really doesn't mean anything. Okay? So um, we're going to work with a body of text um, first. And that body is um, the first chapter of Vitruvius's text on, on architecture. And I have on the course website, if we go to, whoops, wrong, wrong page, sorry. If we go to today's exercise, exercise 110, at the bottom, you'll see Vitruvius 10 books on architecture, chapter 1. It's a Word file. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it, and it's going to download the Word file. Okay? I'll go ahead and show it in my folder. There it is, Vitruvius chapter 1. Let me copy it and put it onto my flash drive into today's folder. And actually, it's already here, so I don't really have to worry about it. But um, this saves you from having to find it or Google it or whatever. We just need some text to work with. And I don't want you to have to write anything. Right? This isn't a writing class. It's not English. right? So we're going to start with that um, Vitruvius. And I'm going to go ahead and in the world of InDesign, I want to take my text and I want to put it into this document. Okay? And the natural reaction would be, oh, well, let me go ahead and, and create a text box. And then I'll go open Word, and I'll copy my text, and I'll press Control-V, and I'll paste it in. Okay? Well, yes, technically speaking, that will work. But it's not really the ideal way of bringing it in. So instead, just like with the images that we've done, I'm going to start by creating a frame. So I come to that frame tool, the rectangle with the X in it, exactly like we used last time. And I'm going to go ahead and draw right, where I want to put the text. Okay? And so we'll go ahead and create a box there. Then I'll go up to File and Place. And last time I looked for my images to drop in. This time I'm going to look for that Word file. There it is. And I'll go ahead and say Open. And guess what? Instead of placing an image in the frame, it's now placed the text in the frame. Okay. It does also, and this is part of why I wanted to bring this up and use this file, is it does say, wait a minute, I'm missing the Times Roman bold font that I, I should have. Okay. I'll go ahead and click on Find Font. We have Times Roman and Times Roman Bold. 
on times Roman, right? Let's go ahead and replace it with times new Roman. All right? And let's change all. The times Roman bold, I'm going to change it to times new Roman in bold, change all, and there we go, I'll click done. Notice that the pink went away when I did that, right? The pink was just a guess what, something's wrong, okay? So now I have this piece of text that's been placed into the page, right? But if I look down here at the very bottom right corner, you guys see how I have that little that's weird. On the screen, it looks like a black plus. For you guys, it'll be red on your, on your actual screens. You guys see that little icon? Okay. That means that there is more text that continues after this text box. Okay. So one of the really neat things about the world of InDesign is you can go ahead and create another frame. Go like that. And then with the black arrow, the regular selection tool, I can click on that little plus icon. And when I click on it, I load up the text, and then I can drop it into this frame. And so the text continues in this frame. Okay, let me create that again. Let me start with another frame here. Okay, there's that plus sign. So I'll go back to the black arrow. I'll click on the plus sign again. There it is. I load up my text, and I can continue where I left off. Okay. So that's pretty cool, right? Certainly an easy way of putting text where you want it to put. The n better thing is that this is live and these objects will respond to each other. So let's say that, no, this is a little too wide. Let me make it narrower, okay? The text still flows through all three boxes and it readjusts, right? So there's no, well, let me take this piece and copy it into another text box or any of that stuff. It flows naturally through all of these boxes. So no matter how I adjust, this first box, the rest matches up, right? So I can work my way through, and it's always going to flow through each of those boxes. If I make this longer, oops, right? So this is a very critical piece of what the world of InDesign can do with text, okay? The other thing that happens is I can save my work, and then I can go back to my Word file, and I can keep working and I can replace the text with the new Word document down the road, right? if you like to do your typing in Word, for example. Okay? So it is referenced just like an image file is. And that's really something that's important for you guys to, to know and not to understand. Okay? So when I start to look at the text itself, right? and I'm going to switch my units into inches. It's just bugging me. It doesn't really matter for what we're doing. When I start to look at the text itself, it would be helpful to have my overall uh, setup designed around fonts and typography. And so over here on the right side, much like the world of Photoshop, see how there's something sa that says Essentials? Right? That's the default workspace is Essentials. Most of the time we work in Essentials. But since we're dealing with fonts, it would be helpful to switch from Essentials into Typography. And when we do that, we get different options that have to do with um, our, our font, including text wrap, uh, paragraph styles, and character styles. Right? We're going to work through what all of those mean in just a second. So let's take a look, and I'm going to double click to get inside the text box. Let's take a look at this first chapter one heading. Okay? So I've selected it, and up here at the ribbon at the top, I have a variety of options that are available to me. Obviously, I have the ability to change the font. Right? If I didn't like Times New Roman, I could switch to mm, do Century Gothic, okay? something different. Okay? I could adjust whether it's in bold, italic, regular, or bold, italic. I can adjust the um, height in points. So maybe I don't want it to be 16, I want it to be 18. So we make it a little bit bigger, right? Below here, right, this is the leading right here. And it's by default, when it's on auto, it will show in parentheses, right? If I want the space between to be bigger, I can increase the space here, 
Right? And of course, it's not letting me do it right now. We'll go back to auto. It's because this isn't multi-line. If I was here in this paragraph, it would do it. See? So generally speaking, leaving it as auto is, is reasonable. Okay, let me come back to the title here. Okay? As we come over, right, I have my first option here, which is the kerning or the space between the letters. Right? And so if I placed, let me zoom in a little bit here, and we look, oops, and we look at chapter one. Move it over a little bit. Right? And so this is the kind of thing that we were talking about where some of the spacing is uneven. Right? We can put the cursor in between two letters, and we can adjust how much space is between those two letters on an individual basis until it feels right. A little bit more space here. One more. Right. And so I'd have, to, I'd have to step back and look at it to make sure that I, I had the right spacing. But we can work our way through what's appropriate spacing in between all of those letters. So again, that's the kerning. Okay. Down here, we have the tracking, right? which would be not on an individual letter basis, but on a paragraph basis. So let me zoom back, and we'll select this paragraph. Right? And we could make this bigger. See how the spacing between the letters, the words, all gets bigger? Right? I told you I would teach you how to make your papers longer. Right? This is where it happens. Okay? But notice that if I zoom out, the font size is the same, but it does start to feel like it's stretched out a bit. Okay? But that's something that you can most definitely do right here under tracking. Okay? Yeah? Is it possible to do that in Word? No. You'd have to do the layout in InDesign. But that's OK. Uh, the hope is by the time you're done with this class, you'll learn to do your layout work in InDesign anyway. Um, when we get to inserting images and flowing text around images, no matter how much you want Word to do it, it sucks at doing it, if we're being honest about it. InDesign is awesome at doing it. And therefore, you'll learn to, uh, especially when you get to multi-page documents, that this is just really the, the route to go. Right? That will change. <laughs> I will convince you. I promise. Uh, OK, so as we move forward, let me zoom back in a little bit. Right. We have the ability to increase the height of the text. Not that you would choose to do this, but you could, for example, make the text taller. Right? That's just stretching the text, though, so it doesn't really help too much. Oops. We'll go back to 100. Right? I also have the ability to make one of the letters a subscript or a superscript. So essentially, I can, I can raise something up. right? So if I wanted to do something to the second power, an exponent or whatever, I could do that. right? If I wanted to do first, oops, let me go back to 0. So let's see here. Right, if I went 1 and then I typed st for first, right? I could take this, start by making it smaller. And then I could come over to this superscript, and we could raise it up like that. Okay, So you can do that. You have the option of doing that. Okay. Isn't there yeah. also a superscript button? I don't know if there is an InDesign. I, mean, I think it's the, like the one next to the two capital Cs. Oh, right there. Yes, thank you. Sorry. So this essentially does the same thing. Okay, um, It's a preset for it. Sorry about that. Uh, so we have that. We have the width. We could make one of these words italicized. So again, this is not the strategy to go, but we could slant the word if we wanted to. Okay? And obviously, I'm starting to butcher this. It doesn't look as good anymore, but you get the idea. Okay, Then we come over to our paragraph settings. right? And so let's look at the paragraph as a whole. Right here, right? So we get to the paragraph settings. We could center the paragraph. We could go to the right, to the left justification. 
we could um, you know, make sure it's both left and right justified. Okay? This is a little bit harder to read because the spacing changes on the paragraph. Generally, this is a little bit easier and certainly more common. Uh, we can indent the whole paragraph if we want to. Um, we can indent just the first line of the paragraph. We could do a reverse indent on the first line of the paragraph, for example. So you've got a lot of flexibility about the kinds of things that you can set up. Right? We could add space before the paragraph or space after the paragraph. And we can also do what's called drop caps on the paragraph. Let me get this back Oops. to 0 and 0. All right, so let's say I wanted the first, the number one, to take up multiple lines. Right? I can say that I want the first two characters. Right, this is the number of lines. So there's one line, two lines, three lines. And I want both the one and the period included in that. If I increase this, I get the space and the T. You get the idea. So I can drop cap one of the, the letters to create a certain uh, look. Okay. I can also create bullet points if I wanted to. So these, these are already numbered, but I could instead um, make them bullet points or I could number them automatically. Right? I could get rid of the numbers. So you've got a lot of flexibility in the kinds of things that you can do. Obviously one period and then two period doesn't, doesn't work, but uh, I could instead substitute and have that uh, where the number is assigned by InDesign. Okay? Uh, so all of this is great on an individual basis. I could go through and I could make these corrections and I could select various things in my document. Notice, however, that throughout this document there's some words that are bold. Okay? Now, I could go through and I could select, let's say I wanted the words that were bold all to be a different font. Right? I could go through and I could select the word and I could come over here and I could change the font um, to Century Gothic or, or whatever. Okay? But going through and selecting each of these words would be rather daunting through your whole document, especially if you thought of the document as a 20-page paper or something. Right? Going through and selecting them all would be bad. So what we can do in the world of InDesign is instead of relying on an individual change, is we can set up two different things. One is called a character style and the other is called a paragraph style. Right? And they both have different settings that can be applied. The advantage of a character style or a paragraph style is it's a repetitive style that can be used throughout the document. Furthermore, if you change the character style, if you edit it, it will change throughout your document. Right? You change the font that's assigned with the character style, it will change everywhere you have that character style assigned. Okay? So it can be a really powerful thing. So let's start with this first bold word right there. I'm going to go to character styles. I'm going to create a brand new character style. I'm going to rename this character style bold text or something like that. And then we'll come through and we'll look at the basic character formats. Okay? Number one, I want the font to be in Century Gothic. I want it to be bold. Right now it's 16 point. Right, so all of those are fine. All of these that are blank are things that I haven't done anything to. Okay? We could go into advanced character formats if I wanted a baseline shift or to skew, etc. If I wanted to make the color something specific, right? if I wanted to underline that piece, right? if I wanted to cross out, all of those are available as options to me. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And now that text right here has the bold text applied to it. Let me go ahead and take this bold text and apply bold text to it. Notice that as soon as I select it and as soon as I click on the character style, it's now updated to that character style. Okay? But maybe you say, wait a minute, the, the text is too big. Right? I want it to be smaller. I can double click on bold text which brings back up the character style options. I can go to basic character formats and I can say, you know what, I really want the size to be small. I want it to be 10 point. And furthermore, while I'm here, let me look at the color and I want all of the, the text to be blue. Now when I say OK, it will update the size and the color of all of those wherever they are in the document. Okay? So it's really something to get used to setting up early because it will add to consistency throughout your document. Right? If, for example, you were doing a history paper or an English paper or something and you wanted to cite 
specific things using a, a, a particular you know, MLA style or something like that. You wanted to cite a source, and that source used an italicized whatever font. right? You could go through and set up one of these character styles, and then everywhere you used it, you would just apply that character style, and it would look exactly the same. Okay? So it can be a big advantage, and it can save you time. Okay? The other option that we have is we can set up a paragraph style. And the paragraph styles are designed for paragraph settings versus character settings. So in this case, right, let's start with a paragraph style. I'm going to select this paragraph. I'm going to create a new paragraph style. And we'll call this um, paragraph, for lack of something better. Okay? Now, Within the paragraph style, we can override a character style by providing character formats. For the most part, I would ignore character formats and I would do the two of them separate. You can get yourself into a little bit of trouble. Uh, so ignore the character formats and we're going to come down first to indents and spacing. So the first option here is do we want the alignment to be left, right, or center, or justified, etc. Okay, we'll leave it at left. If I come down to paragraph rules, I don't need to change any of these, right? Do I want to hyphenate the text or not? That's a checkbox, right? Let's keep coming down. Here's drop caps and nested styles, okay? So right now, because it was created based on this paragraph, I have a drop cap of three lines. So it's down one, two, three, and two characters, okay? So that's set. Bullets and numbering, right now I don't have any bullets and numbering. I don't have any character color, etc. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And I now have that set up as the primary paragraph. So the advantage is that I can then come to the second paragraph right here. And I can choose that that should be primary paragraph. And see how it does the same thing. All right, let me take the third paragraph. We'll make it primary paragraph. So you can see how it's taking the first and applying it to all the subsequent paragraphs. Okay, Neat concept. We could go back into primary paragraph. We could change rules. right? So we could go in and we could say, you know what? I want uh, this to be a numbered list. We can change the format of the numbers, etc. I can go ahead and say OK. And now automatically it adds my numbers. In that case, the drop caps probably aren't important. So let me come back to drop caps. We'll set them at 0 and 0. And now the paragraphs are naturally numbered for me. Okay? So you kind of get how this works. right? Remember, I could apply it to paragraph 4 by just clicking on paragraph 4. And it applies. I know I'm getting duplicate numbers. It's because the text has the numbers in it, too. OK, so the character styles and the paragraph styles are absolutely critical to get used to because once you set them up, you can use them over and over again, which is a really big advantage. OK, so uh, now that I've finished this for now, I'm just going to leave it open and we're going to move on to another part of this. And the, the second part is that sometimes you want to be able to um, install your own font on one of the school computers. And I, I will warn you ahead of time that I haven't verified that this works on the newest version of these computers. So it's entirely possible this will fail miserably. But we're going to hope that it does, that, that it doesn't. Uh, and that is that we can't install a font. Let's say I have my own font. I want to install it on this computer. Because they're all locked, you can't install it. There is, however, an aftermarket portable application that will let you temporarily install a font on your computer. It's called the AMP Font Viewer. There's a tutorial for it, Digital Tools or Digital Life 0.15, which gives you a link, which will take you to this website, which you can then download right here at the top. Right, we're going to pick the external mirror one, and we hope that it will start. There it is. It downloads. We need to show it. Then we need to extract it to our own flash drive. So I'm going to extract all, make sure it goes to my flash drive. We'll put it right here. Okay. Once that's done, I can double click and open this fontviewer.exe application. And when that opens, it opens up a preview of all the fonts that are installed on the system. 
but it will also allow me to go to not installed fonts and browse for a new font. Okay? I have some that are already on my flash drive, but you may need to go find something. So for example, there's lots and lots of free fonts that are available out there for you. And if I go, a uh, good website is Font Squirrel, for example, uh, fontsquirrel.com. And you can look through a variety of fonts that, that people have written and, and give away uh, with Creative Commons licenses or, or something like that. Obviously, there are paid fonts that are out there as well. But for your purposes, pick a free font. right? So let's say I like this into uh, Intro Rust, for example. I'm going to download the font. And there it is, free. Let me add to, add to the cart. Let me add it. And I'm finished. Let's see here. OK. OK, this one's going to make me log in. So let's see if I can find one that I don't have to log in. All right, let's try this script one. All right, see, that one downloads directly. So it looks like some of these say off-site, so you have to go somewhere else, fill out a form or whatever. This Alex brush allowed me to download it. Let me go ahead and show it in its folder. It's a zip file. I'm going to extract it just like I did with the others to my flash drive. I'll browse. And generally on my flash drive, it's on my other drive. Uh, I have a folder that's called resources. So let me create a new folder, call this resources. And then inside of resources, I'll have a folder called fonts. And then we'll go ahead and extract that right here. Okay, So there it is, Alex Brush Regular. It does include whatever the license is. Generally, the license is you can't use it for commercial purposes. You can't sell it. But um, for, for our purposes, there's usually never a problem. Okay, so now I need to install that Alex Brush regular onto this system. So I'm going to go to the font viewer, which I had open, and I'm going to browse for my flash drive. And I'm going to look in my folder, in resources, in fonts, and there it is. Okay, and once I have it selected, there's a button for install font temporarily. Once I click that, yes, go ahead, it's now temporarily on the system. Okay, which is great. So I can now use it as if it were installed on the system. If you're working on your own computer, if you're working at home, it's no problem. You can just install it directly because you have admin rights on your computer and you can install it. Right? But sometimes you're working at home and you really like a font and you want to make sure it's here. This is how you would temporarily do it. Okay? So it's been installed. Now, once it's installed, you have to leave this application open and we're going to come back to InDesign. Unfortunately, we didn't install the font before we opened InDesign. It's a weird quirk of the, the, uh, the InDesign program that we have to close InDesign and open it again. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'll go to File, Save. And let's save it into today's folder. Uh, 110, this is fall of 2016. And I'll save. Okay, then I'm going to close InDesign. I'm going to open it again. Okay, and now I could take, for example, this Education of the Architect, and I could change it to that Alex brush, which is, of course, not listed. What was it called? Was it an Alex brush? Oh, I'm not responding. Let me try this again. Let me try that one more time and see if it'll do it for me. If it doesn't work, I'll find a piece of software that will work.
All right, let's see if it is here. Here it is, Alex Brush. Okay, and obviously in this case, um, it's all capital, so it doesn't look right. So let's try the education of. Okay. It's also the reason it's showing up as pink is because it was asking me for bold. There isn't a bold version. So I can get rid of this piece as well. So there it is, the education of the architect. And I can do the same kinds of things where I can increase the size of this, etc. Okay. So the point is that I can load in any custom font that I want. And I can start to collect a collection of fonts that work because sometimes a font just is better than something else for what you're trying to, uh, to show. So I ask that you play around with the uh, Vitruvius text a little bit. But when you're done with that, uh, in the last part, part three, and, and probably the part that will take you the most time, I'm asking you to create a word art uh, graphic that represents you. Okay? And what I mean by word art is if you do a Google search, um, there are some really cool ones out there that are self-portraits like this. I'm not asking you to do one of those, right? They're probably a little bit too intense. However, there's a lot of ones that are more like this, right? So put together some words that inspire you or about you or whatever. Arrange them graphically using a variety of fonts, sizes, etc., right? Typography and create something like this that represents you and who you are, right? If you do a Google search, you can find some pretty cool ones that are out there. Um, that have been very, very well done. Okay, So if you do that Google search, but there's also similar, just plain ones right? that can start to, to define who you are and what you do. Okay, That's what I want you to do and post at the end of class today. It will give you a lot of experience with fonts, types, sizes, spacing, tracking, kerning, et cetera. Okay? Are there any questions? Does this make sense for what I'm after? Uh, there may be some. It depends on the font that you're using as to what symbols libraries they have. All right, I'll turn you loose.